Hello, uh, welcome to another show, uh, stand-up interview. Uh, to that, tonight's guest is uh, Brian Jando on the other side of the pond. Hello, Brian. Hello, Madej. How are you? Hey, perfect, perfect. I'm just going to do a quick introduction in Slovenian as well. Uh, dobar večer, dobar došli, kadar kol gledate, dobro jutro, dobar dan. Uh, danes se znaju Brian Jandorn iz Amerike in ima zelo zanimivo uh, zgodovino, boste vzvedli tekom intervjuja in tudi spletno stran uh, Breaking Down Bits, kjer s, s komiki pogovarja o njihovih šalah in jih raščleni. And let's continue in English now. So, uh, how are you, Brian? Uh, I see you have nice weather. Uh, are the clubs open now in Texas? Uh, yes, absolutely perfect weather today here in Houston, Texas. And our clubs have been open, uh, really, or at least my club that I run has been open since September of 2020. Oh, so no lo lockdown period for you? The, uh, a short period in Texas, uh, maybe all in all, five months we, we did have a period where we were completely shut down for about two months they tried to reopen and then that didn't really work after three weeks they closed us back down for a few more like maybe six weeks and then we were open but uh all that to say we did it as safely as we could you know we had our tables socially distanced six feet apart mass required uh plexiglass at the bars uh you know hand sanitizer everywhere so we did it safely as possible Oh, perfect, perfect. Okay, uh, now when, when uh, let's talk about comedy now. Uh, you you had a lot of time to prepare for material then, uh, and how long have you do, been doing comedy for? Uh, three years uh, last week. Oh, perfect! An yeah. anniversary. Yeah. And you're you're already running shows. You have a very successful web page. Uh, breakingdownbits.com. We're going to return to it a couple of times because you had really fantastic guests and really good interviews. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, did uh, you did the uh, the riot show, the riot comedy show, right? Yes, uh, correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you tell uh, me something, uh, some more words about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, so that's such that's the club and show that we've been running since September consistently. Uh, this year we'll do about 450 shows. Uh, so those will be about 420, 25 or so at our venue. And then a couple and another 25 to 50 out in the community, uh, public and private events. And so we're very busy <laughs> and, uh, we're actually in the process of planning our first comedy festival, uh, next year, March of next year. So a lot going on in, in, with our comedy show. And a lot of the guests that you've seen on Breaking Down Bits are comics that come and do our show and vice versa. A lot of the people that come and do our comedy show also do Breaking Down Bits. Nice, nice. Uh, have you traveled around the country perhaps uh, due to this Breaking Down Bits uh, show? You know, it's helped move around the country. I mean, I've, I've, done, uh, I've done shows in Boston and Baltimore, New York. Uh, I'm about to do LA next month. I've got Phoenix in a couple months. So, I, you know, I travel a little bit personally with family or for business and uh and business now is for comedy honestly which is kind of neat uh but uh but no i um i lost you, you still here yeah, yeah of course of oh, course okay. i just made a, a solo picture of you because yeah nobody needs uh, to listen to me like looking uh, <laughs> oh no problem but yeah yes yeah, so i've been able to travel cross country mm -hmm. no perfect perfect um Three years, and already you have more than 30 shows per, per week, uh, per month, and a comedy festival. Uh, you, I heard that in the States, it's usually you need a longer time before you get to that level of uh, comedian. How is it? Do you have anything in your past, for instance, that you would suggest other comedians do to, to follow your lead? Yeah, great question. Uh, I mean, I'm a little bit older, you know, so that that the, that is true. You do need to get that stage time and it does take years to kind of narrow and hone in on your act. But when you're older like me, you know, I'm almost 39. I'll be 39 next month. I've had a lot of life experiences uh, that I can pull from for material. Uh, more, And also before comedy, uh, I was running a business. Uh, actually, I still operate that business. And uh, of course, comedy is now a business in itself. But uh, I was also doing something called Toastmasters, which is an international organization. I'm not sure if you're familiar, familiar with it, but it's public speaking. And so I've been doing that for three years before getting into comedy um, and actually continue, not as much as I used to, but I still continue to, to go to some of those meetings and work on, on just public speaking, which of course is the bedrock of uh, performing stand-up comedy. 
So uh, actually, you got a lot of stage time already with the Distos Masters. Uh, people, I don't know, uh, some of our uh, listeners are familiar with the show, uh, the the concept of Toastmasters, and uh, yeah, of course. Stage time is stage time, but doing comedy is a bit harder than holding a speech, is it not? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's no question. Uh, figuring out uh, how to speak the language, how to it really is a language, writing comedy. Uh, and so there's there's a lot of different uh, books that, you, you know, Judy Carter, the new comedy Bible is out. It's out on audiobook as well. So I'm actually doing that right now. Um, there's a lot of good resources out there on how to write jokes. So um, it's important that if you are getting into comedy or if you're new into comedy, that you learn the language before you uh, before you uh, really before you take the next step into getting to the next level. And uh, and then, of course, you know, the performance aspects like we talked about with Toastmasters, all that stuff comes into play. Uh, and then things like the timing and uh, and in voice inflection, uh, all those things are, are all, all come into the mix. And it's just a lot of variables. And it just takes a lot of time uh, in writing and a lot of time in, in performing and being on stage to really get the hang of it. And admittedly, I'm still just a, uh, a, an infant. You know, I, I'm three years in. I still got a lot to learn. But I have the, the luxury of having, you know, eight, nine shows a week where I can practice and hold my craft in front of good audiences. Well, perfect, perfect. Uh, I've seen you uh, do your shows already. I'm going to link it in the some where it's going to be a box around here. Uh, for instance, I was quite impressed for a three-year-old comic. You already do act-outs, which is, uh, even in our country, it's quite strange to do it so early. Um, where did you find the inspiration for that? Uh, yeah, it's actually a big part of my act, right? Uh, I just think a lot of it comes from talking to people on breaking down bits early on in some of the early episodes, like one through 10, Drew and I, my, my co-hosts are really inquiring a lot about act outs. If, if you went back and listen. And so that was something that we were just thinking about and practicing. And so if you, you know, we're about to record episode 50 on Monday uh, with the Hamid Weinberg, a terrific comedian uh, originally from Philly, now in LA, he's coming to do our show next weekend, the riot, but uh, you know, that'd be our 50th episode. And you've, if you've been following along with us, like, you know, like I said, act outs were kind of a big part in the beginning. Uh, then we, we get into a lot of like hosting, submitting to comedy festivals. And now a lot of our stuff is more on like headlining and those types of things. So you've kind of been able to grow up with us over the last two years as comics as we go through these interviews. But, yeah, it, it stemmed early from from those early interviews. And then also maybe from some of my favorite comics like uh, Sebastian Maniscalco, for example, who's terrific with act outs. Uh, uh, some of the people who have been on the show, Francisco Ramos is a great example of somebody who's good with uh, with act outs. So yeah, just being inspired by other comics that that showed us the way. Perfect. You, uh, you also uh, you mentioned Judy Carter already, the comedy bible, but you had a comedy author as well as a guest, Sam Talent, running the light. Uh, but yeah. Are you interested in in writing about comedy as well? Uh, as just uh, could you just do a quick introduction? Of what's uh, about the running the light? What's in the book? Yeah, yeah. So Sam Talent, of course, is a past guest of, uh, of Breaking Down Bits. He's also uh, performed at the Riot, my comedy show, and he's coming back next month to perform at the Riot with us. So we love Sam, uh, one of the best comics that's out there. What's interesting about Running the Light? It's a it's a great book. It's a it's a it's 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 fiction. It's a it's a fictional character that Sam's created. Uh, this comic who's kind of he's, he's just been run down by the road. He's he's kind of gone through it. He went through a big scandal in his career. And now he's just working the road and it's just uh, just having these these just wild interactions while on the road. And it's a bit of a cautionary tale of, uh, you know, if, if you if you really go hard into the into the life, if you go maybe into the drugs and alcohol side of the scene and and, you know, this guy gets into prostitutes and all this stuff like you can really go the wrong way with this thing. And so it is a cautionary tale, but it's a great read. Sam is an, an incredible uh, writer. A cautionary tale, perhaps like uh, 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 the catcher in the the the, yeah. the ride. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh -huh. tale. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Um, did you ever consider writing uh, in comedy as well, like writing about comedy, since you're doing this uh, your fiftieth show already? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I can write as well as JD Solinger and, uh, and Catcher in the Rye, but look, uh, or Sam for that matter, but. 
Uh, no, I mean, it's inevitably, it's something that I'll do. I mean, this is, this has become my passion. This is my whole life. I mean, I, 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 I between the, the podcast, between the comedy show, the comedy festival, everything that we're doing with the comedy show, you know, we're, we're, we're now operating a club. We're looking at opening more clubs. We're about to buy a condo where the comms stay when they come to perform on the show. So, um, all that to say, I think I, I, I know that I have a lot to offer especially not now, but, you know, maybe in, in five years when I can reflect on everything that we've done and, and everything that we set to accomplish uh, and talk about the business side of comedy and really help people, like you said, you know, get uh, through it faster than you're supposed to, uh, you know, with this arc that I've been on within three years and share my experiences about that. Yeah, perfect. Uh, we, we we always look for like shortcuts in life, but uh I, I'm, I started, uh, early, uh, didn't start early in comedy either. So I was in my 30s as well when I started. And yeah, okay, you have life experience. You can talk some about some stuff that I, I don't know, a 20-year-old cannot. But still, you have to do the time. You still have to do the time. And uh, organizing your own shows makes it perfect. So you're emceeing, you're performing, you're doing material, and you're gathering, gathering stage time and learning from great comics. For instance, like Mark Norman. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Mark was uh, as a guest on our show and, and somebody that we've got to know over the years. And uh, you know what a what a great comedian. But you, I mean, you said it best. You know, you get to learn from them. But more importantly, I think you get to form these relationships. Even if you know we get to perform and 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 work with some of the the top comedians in the country and and in the world, quite frankly. But uh, even if you're just running your own local show and just making com making relationships and establishing relationships with comics in your own town and, and maybe towns in the surrounding areas, then it becomes a currency, right? So then you can trade stage time and it gives you the opportunity to get out and grow on different stages and, uh, and develop faster. Mm -hmm. uh, great advice uh, for Slovenian comics who are listening. Uh, here in Slovenia, there's about 80 working comedians or so. Uh, we are a popula our population of our country is about 2 million. So we're a small country here in Europe. Uh, and uh, yeah, everybody knows each other. So usually the best advice is don't be an asshole. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. Don't run the light. And uh, that's it. Just have fun. And people are really giving here. For instance, the, the, the top level guys who have their own TV shows, who are performing for tens of uh, for decades already uh, they share their advice freely uh, on this uh, interview page of mine and in in live sessions even more because you know we travel together you you're in a car for a couple of hours you talk about comedy it's inevitable <laughs> so yeah uh, how is it with, with you are people like really open in in texas in your uh, comedy uh, scene or are they like oh let's have some secrets just for me yeah um, well, let me, let me actually take something that you said just a moment ago first. Uh, you said, you know, don't be an asshole. And, and that, that is sort of the adage that's out there. But let's uh, I, I take it to, I take, tend to take a more positive spin, be more of an optimist, if you will. And, and, and actually, I heard it from Mike Vecchione, a uh, terrific New York comic who was on our show last weekend. Mike said, uh, you know, just be nice to everybody. Uh, it doesn't it's not that much effort to just be nice to everybody. So. Uh, you know, beyond just don't be an asshole. No, take the other side and be nice. And his his example was uh, uh, Mike got to got to to be in the movie uh, King of Staten Island with the, with of course Pete Davidson, who may be possibly the, the the most popular comedian in the world right now because of everything. You know, maybe off with Kim Kardashian and everything. It's you know, but uh, you know that that got him the opportunity to being nice to 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 Pete and Ricky Velez, who were the producers on that movie. Uh, and and uh, uh, allowed him to get that that audition and get that role. And just because he was nice to those guys as they were coming up was his point. And so, yeah, so you got to be nice. But to directly answer your question, uh, you know, our scene, uh, we probably have, I would guess, about 300 or so working comics just in our city alone. Uh, on our show, The Riot, I think we've, we've eclipsed working with over 300 comics at this point. We list them all out on our website. And uh, yeah, I mean, like anything with that many people, there's going to be clicks. There's going to be people. There's going to be envy. Uh, there's only so many spots. There's only so many opportunities. There's only so many people who will get out of this thing and make it and get maybe the TV credits, get to famous, whatever that looks like. And so there's challenges, right? And then there's, of course, there's the opposite sex. There's there's every kind of sex. There's 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 uh, you know there's non-binary. There's everything in between. 
and, uh, and and you just put everybody in the mix and, and different personalities might clash. Um, different races may there may be racial tension at times. You know, there, there's there's things that happen in the world that that cause uh, divide. And, and so comedy is not immune to that. And in fact, if we're doing our job, we're supposed to find ways to make fun of that and bring light of some of those things. That, that's our job. And so there can be tension. And uh, so, yeah, that 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 surfaces all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we comics usually are, okay, some are extremely extroverted, but I, I figured out that mostly people are introverted and like uh, careful about what they talk about with, in, uh, of course, uh, polite society. Uh, a gr great point that you've made uh, with the, the Comedy Riot show, uh, I, I wanted to ask you to, if you could elaborate on the set list uh, a couple of comedians in our country are, of course, familiar. We did it a couple of times, but uh, you do set list as well, I've seen in, in the Riot Show. Uh, could you talk about set list, uh, for instance, how you prepare it? How do you gather the, the suggestions and uh, what set list actually is? So, so you're asking about like set list for when I perform? Um, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, you know, that's something that, uh, and I, and I'm probably one of the worst at this. Uh, and I, and I do recognize we talk to pro comics and they're talking about, Hey, write every day. And they talk about, uh, you know, I prepare my set list and I look it over and all stuff. I do usually minutes before our show, I will, I will, I will prepare a set list and I use a, an app called comedy companion, comedy companion. It's become a very important app in my life. So quite simply, it's a it, it's it's bare bones. It just does what it needs to do. You put all your jokes in there. You can write all transcribe all of your jokes um, and, and you can either put them in in development or you can basically put them in finished, although I'd argue that nothing's ever finished. Uh, and then from there, you can drag those jokes over to a set list. And you also assign how much time each of those bits are. So it, it then adds up the time for you. So, I mean, it's just this wildly powerful tool, super simple that allows you to say, how much time do I have? And, and a lot of times, sometimes you don't know right before you get on a gig, uh, how much time you're going to have. Right. So it just allows you to just quickly edit and uh, give it one last glance before you get on stage and, 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 you know, give yourself permission to deviate off of it. You know, I, Drew and I lately, if you've been listening to the show, we've been talking a lot about crowd work and hosting and those types of things. And, you know, we do, We've been, we both of I have been, both him and I have been challenging ourselves to do more crowd work up top and then, and then find ways to take what we talked about with the crowd and pull that into the, the, the material that we prepared in our set list. So, um, yeah, so I do, I do do set lists and sometimes I'll, you know, during the day, if I know I have a gig coming up, I'll, I'll be putting some thought into it. I'm not really a pen to paper guy, which is why I don't write. I do write every day in the sense, not right but I, I I'll, I'll think and obsess about some of the bits that I'm working on so I do that exercise every day uh, but but no I'm not sitting down writing I'm not sitting down prepping a set list and the set list stuff I do minutes before I get on stage for the most part oh perfect perfect yeah uh, the, the most famous write down uh, comedian is probably Seinfeld still mm -hmm. and uh, Norm, even, even Mark Norman had all the scribbles but uh, usually yep. he just does keywords and then uh, figures it out later Right. Uh, oh, so the children's are, children are waking up. <laughs> yeah, one of them's one of them's home. It's it's when they're both home that we we really have the issue. So yeah. ah, perfect, perfect. Uh, so how do you combine, for instance, your family life with your comedy life? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting one, right? Because when I first started running this comedy show, uh, well, actually, when I first got into comedy, my wife was very understanding. I was just like, look, I'm going to get the kids to bed, and I'm going to be out basically every night of the week doing open mics. And, uh, and that's what I did for, for like a year straight. I would just go to every open mic I could get to. I would do probably about six to 10 every week. And, uh, and she was cool with that. I think she was pregnant at the time. So, or, or wait, no, we, I'm sorry. We did just had a newborn. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, she wasn't going anywhere, you know, anyway. So, that was the that part, and that, that became frustrating to her. But at least with open mics, you can either you can choose to not go because it's not like it's an actual show. So if she had something we had to get to or whatever, I could just do that and not do the mics, right? Or I would find I would find ways to do the mics after. But things have changed now, right? So now we we have this show. It's a real commitment. Uh, we when I first started it, it was every other one night, every other weekend, and then. 
I was like, all right, honey, I'm going to have the show one night every other weekend. And then it ended up becoming one night every week. And then it became two nights every week. And she started to get like, hey, wait a minute. Like this, you, you, this was supposed to be, you know, one night a week at most. And here we are two nights a week. I'm like, well, funny you say that. Now we're moving to three nights. And then it ended up being four nights. And, and so that was an adjustment, right? But um, it's, she, it wasn't easy at first. She's like, hey, look, now I, I, I'm never going to have weekends with you. And I'm like, no, 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 no. If I have to be there, I, I'll set it up so I can be there. And, and, she, and she's kind of gotten comfortable with that. She's like, but she recognized we can't just do something on a whim, which is, which is okay. You know, that's, that's fine. We just have to plan a little bit. Uh, but even now, like I've set it up where if I can't make a show, I can still get coverage for it. I have a whole team. I've got, uh, you know, my co-producer, Drew. I've got an assistant GM, a full-time employee that's, that's basically there every night. I'm about to have an intern that starts in May. And so I've got this whole team that's made her a little bit more comfortable with it. But to work around it, uh, basically, we go out on either a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night. That, that, that becomes sort of my family nights or my date nights with my wife. And uh, that's just how my life is now. You know, that's uh, I've, I've sacrificed nights and weekends and I'm OK with it. I, you know, I actually at this stage in my life, I'm not trying to go out and party or drink. It's not really interesting to me. So I would rather be the performer and the person that's putting on the shows that provides the entertainment for the people going out than being on the other side of the stage. Uh, another question in this direction, if you said your, your mind is used to be a more business oriented and where do you see yourself or what do you want to achieve in a couple of years? Yeah, great question. So of course you're about to do the comedy festival. And, and so that's a big, big milestone for us. We've got a, a, a deal with our club that we, the venue that we operate now, we, we booked with them for five years. So we now operate and work with them for five years. But um, our next ambition uh, after that, hopefully the end of 2023 will be the timing of this. We would like to um, purchase our own property uh, where we would build another club in Houston. So if you're not familiar with if the Houston market is massive. It's uh, 7 million people in the metropolitan area. Uh, it's this huge land area. And, and there's just there's room in this for for in my opinion for another 10 clubs I and mean, there really is and so uh our strategy is to get one, one another club and we'll operate it ideally with our food and beverage partner which is our venue now you know they're they're along for the ride so we never have to worry about food and beverage we can always just worry about putting on the best comedy productions as possible so in five years, what we should have, what we should have is three clubs. We'll have the one we do now at Rudyard's. We'll have another one in North Houston. We'll have another one in West Houston. Uh, and then we'll have a couple comedy condos, which are, we're about to buy our first one where, where comics can stay. So that's, that is the, in, in the comedy festival. So that is Houston. That is, we, that is our, us saying we have the Houston market. Uh, and then beyond that, now, now we'd be looking at other markets in Texas. I've seen that you've done uh, some charity work uh, as well, uh, Haha mm -hmm. for Hope. Yes. Uh, and uh, I thought that this was interconnected with this uh, future plans, perhaps, as well. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that will continue to be our, our, our charity. Uh, we, we did not operate it during the pandemic. And, and it's funny you said that. I, I was just about to reach back out to our uh, charity partner that we selected in 2020. Uh, we were supposed to have an event in October of 2020. We're now going to go ahead. If they're still game with it, we're going to go do it in 2022 of this year or, or October of this year. And uh, what we do is we put on this comedy contest. We'll, we're going to fly down uh, one of our friends from New York to come and headline. And and we've pledged to raise $20,000 uh, through the show for the uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters here in uh, Greater Houston. Uh, we already, we did a holiday one in 2021 where we raised 2000. So we just got, we have another 18,000 more to go. Uh, and the, the kind of the neat part about this format is we had the comedy contest. People vote with their donation dollars. So we have six comics or five comics, whatever we end up doing. And whoever, whichever one they think deserves to win this, this wrestling belt that we make, uh, get, is the one who gets the most in donations. And so that, that ends up being a, a good amount of in-show fundraising, Plus, we'll have a silent auction, uh, possibly a live auction, and then, of course, uh, selling tickets and tables and all this stuff. So that's how you arrive at uh, – and sponsors. That's how you arrive at $20,000. Perfect, perfect. Uh, and here's the web page as well. Oh, thank uh, you. So, yeah, the people can uh, see it, look it up for themselves and uh, join. Of course, join the next time. Uh, you mentioned that you're going to uh, – 
bring a headliner from New York. How important is it in your market that the headliner is really known or, or are people just uh, entering the different venues where, where, wherever the sign stand-up comedy is? Yeah, I mean, I believe it's very important. I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, we, we, we have success with shows where we have uh, with local talent. We also have success where we have shows with uh, people with TV credits. And uh, I, I think, I think it's, uh, I, I believe it's, it's fairly important. It, it adds some validity to our club. You know, the, the, the big 800 pound gorilla in Houston is the Houston improv. Uh, you know, they've been in the market for decades. They bring in the biggest acts. They have 500 plus seats in that place. And so, you know, we have to continue to, 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 to gain uh, mind share and credibility in the marketplace. So as a brand, uh, it's very important. Um, it also gives us the opportunity for the comedy festival to to leverage those relationships to to, to put together an, an incredible lineup uh, since we already have those relationships in place. And so, uh, you know, I w- one thing that we I always focus on when I create something like this is uh, everything that we do has to be attached to quality, and that comes down to like you know from the the merchandise that we make, the shirts have to, excuse me have to be good quality. Of course, the the experience has to be a, the production has to be good quality, and uh, that that includes uh, bringing the the the, the best uh, possible talent. Yeah, perfect, perfect. You mentioned TV credits. Uh, have you been approached by some companies to perform in their commercials, or even uh, been uh, performing somewhere in a show or in a movie, perhaps? Yeah, you know, um, I have done a little bit of acting. I just had a, a movie that I did here with some local filmmakers that just came out. Went to the premiere last week. Uh, that, that that film's called Black Flag. Um, the uh, I've done some commercial work here. What's really been kind of neat is I've been able to do a lot of corporate, um, and not even just in comedy, but also MC work. Uh, so hosting and emceeing events, charity events, uh, other various events, and I had the uh, maybe the coolest thing that's happened to me yet in comedy. I had the opportunity to to work with Jim Gaffigan uh, when he uh, about a month ago when he was here uh, to do a, a charity event or not a charity event, but a, a private event. Well, that's quite an honor. He's yeah. one of the uh, one of the comics on the Olympus of greatest, one of the was, greatest comics. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, was, and the crowd was awesome too. Uh, can you talk about that show, perhaps, or is it confidential? Since it's, since no, it was private, no, it's, it's actually really did, interesting. Did, please do tell more. Yeah, it's really interesting. So they found us through our website, and and uh, and you know that that's one thing. If you're running a show, and that's one thing that I did. I put a I put a just a little button on my website that says uh, private events, and so somebody uh, coming into Houston had found us uh, and and asked us if we could we could do a private event. And, uh, and he's like, yeah, it'll be with Jim Gaffigan. And I was like, wow, okay. Uh, is this a joke? You know? <laughs> uh, but no, it was, it's real life and the pay was excellent. And uh, what, what, what's most interesting about it is it was for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. And uh, what that is, is uh, this, this, this national event, this convention that goes on every year. And it's literally 8,000 real cowboys, ranchers from across the United States and their spouses and maybe their families or whatever. But uh, they all come for this convention every year. And so they, the, the Jim Gaffigan was, the, was the, 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 the one that caps off the whole event. And I guess every, other, every couple of years, they bring in a, a big comedian and a big name. And, uh, and so that's how it came to be. And, uh, and the, there's, we performed in front of, I guess it was like 2,200 cowboys. And, uh, and they loved it, man. I just had a couple standing, had some uh, applause breaks and, you know, they laughed the whole way through. It was just an incredible crowd. Perfect. Uh, how hard was it to keep the at- attention? Uh, one, one of the lessons, for instance, for the, the comedy uh, listeners is you have to keep attention on, on, the, on your performance. And since cowboys, I guess, are quite funny by themselves, it's hard yeah. to get, grab their attention. How do you keep it? You know that scenario was. I mean, they were just so respectful. They they, they weren't shouting anything out. They were it was just it was just this incredible. Even afterwards, Jim Gaffigan was like, "Wow, they were great." Uh, but you know, to answer your question, you know, how do you keep people's attention? Uh, some people some people are afraid of of silence uh, during your set, and quite honestly, silence means they're listening, right? So if you get to a point where you 
where you hit a silent point, you can sit in that for a moment and you're like, oh, okay, they're tuned in. But if they're not tuned in, right, you have the, uh, we, we run our late shows and or it doesn't even have to be the late show, but shows where people might drink a little bit too much. We do serve alcohol at our shows and it happens. And, um, you know, there's a couple tricks to it. If you're hosting or make sure that the host talks about it up top that, Hey, keep your table talk down to a minimum, no shouting out or heckling during the show. And you say that up top because then you can hold them accountable to that throughout the show. Uh, another kind of trick with sort of hosting is, um, get, do the thing up top. It's easy crowd work where you say, Hey, is there any birthdays out there? Is there anybody celebrating anniversaries? Uh, and, and that way you get there, then they get their time. Cause I've seen it. I see it in the middle of a show out of completely out of context where somebody will just shout out, it's my birthday. It's like, no, you don't want that. Right. So it shuts down all that stuff or it gives you the opportunity to come back to it and be like, Hey, remember what we said at the top of the show? Like no talking. And then, you know, it's kind of a two strike thing. Like, Hey, if we have to come back over the next time, we're going to have to ask you to leave. And so you have to have somebody that's policing the room. And, uh, and, and look, I mean, if, in my opinion, like if you, uh, if you do a good job hosting and you do that stuff up top, but also if your room is, is comfortable enough and everybody gets a chance to kind of get, get, get comfortable in the space that they arrived at, they know where the bathrooms are. They know that where, how to get drinks. The waitresses come to them quickly, whatever it is. Uh, there's a lower chance that that type of thing could happen. Uh, also withholding attention, uh, you know, we talked about a minute ago, like crowd work, uh, if you, uh, engage the crowd and then, and then find a way to bring that back into your material later, uh, that's a way to keep them kind of drawn in. It makes it feel like it should make it feel like it's a discussion between you and one person. And that one person is the collective audience. Uh, and that's how you can maintain attention. And then things like you mentioned earlier, uh, act outs is a good way to keep them with you. Um, you know, having uh, moving about, but also moving your voice up and down and having an interesting voice, not having this monotone, delivering every joke at the same rhythm. And uh, I, I, can be, I can go on for hours, but like another one is having different joke types and formats. And so you might do something like like a rule of three and then you might do a misdirect and then you might do a pun. Uh, somebody that just does misdirect over and over and over again, or dark misdirect over one beat type comics, you know, you can only do that for 10 minutes before people start tuning out and being, or, or already knowing where the punchline is going. So it's important as you think about your set list and your joke design to mix up and include different types of jokes and turns throughout your set and throughout your material. Uh, perfect timing. We can mention, for instance, another guest of yours, Scott Dickers, uh, who uh, has <laughs> how to write funny the whole podcast. One of the best. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you go, yeah, uh, yeah, if you go check out, uh, you know, the we, we talk about this all the time. Me and Drew, uh, the funny filters. You know, I think there's ten or twelve of the of the funny filters. Uh, take some material. Take something funny that's happened in your life. Go look at what Scott Dickers wrote uh, in his book, and, and it's available online. You can just go down, download the, the funny filters and then just run your your premise or your idea through these different filters. So um, there's things like hyperbole, so sort of e exaggeration. Um, there's there's all these different types of, of, of filters, and that's the only one that comes to mind right off the top of my head, but all these different things, that, ways that you can, you can look at your material differently in the writing process to come up with the different uh, joke formats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, he <clears throat> he has a funny filter, sarcasm uh, or irony, and he says, yep. "Don't use that too much. Don't use that too much." Because yeah, you, yeah. you get like uh, um, one question. For instance, uh, a young comic as you are, you're probably. Uh, for instance, we talked about Sam Talon before. His uh, material is uh, invented in his mind. It's it's not factual based. Uh, do you prefer factual based material or do you like to make up some stuff from uh, nothing? Yeah, I love that. So all of my comedy is rooted in fragments of truth. That's how I put it. And so a lot of times, what I'll be doing is 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 putting bringing together real life stories that that's happened to me. But it's not in a linear fashion, nor does it necessarily have to come from the same story. So I can give you an example. Uh, there's, a, there's a great joke that I have or that I really enjoy telling on stage where I'm a, I teach my son the pantsing game. I don't know if that's in your culture or not, but it's something where we play a goof on each other, where we pull each other's pants down. It's, it's a dumb thing we do when we're kids, right? And, uh, and so my, my kid in, in my story uh, that I tell on stage in this joke 
he does the, he pants he pulls my pants down in a restaurant while I have a full tray of food in my hands. So in real life that that happened, but it wasn't my son that did it. It was my friend in college while I was in college. Right. And so, but, but it's funnier when it's my son and then, and then it allows me to get into this space where I, where this, there's this dynamic where it's me and the son and then it becomes a prank war. And then I, you know, I leave my, my kid in a hot car and that's the prank that I pull on him. So if, 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 hopefully that's a good example of saying, Hey, look, it's, 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 a, it's based all in true events, but it's all, uh, pulled together, uh, and, and created in this story that, 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 uh, that, that allows it to be a, a, a funny, funny joke. Uh, but your son, I, I remember that bit. You had it in your uh, on your web page. We're going to put it up uh, yeah. in after in the frames. Uh, but uh, perhaps, do, do you take uh, punch ups from from other comics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, absolutely. Uh, when he does this uh, pantsing game. Uh-huh. For instance, uh, you could say it was a bad day to go commando, or how do you say it in yeah. the States? Yeah, no, that's 100% right. Yeah, I play with some things like that, you know. Uh, you know, I do the, the chicken and biscuits set for everybody to see. That's a play on the on the restaurant, the Chick, Chick-fil-A restaurant. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that's another, that, that fits in the beats of the joke. Uh, and uh, you know what? I'll try it, man. Let's go. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Perfect. Let, oh, perfect. Cooperation between comics from That's another p- part of the world. Yay. Let's do this. Uh, do, do please tell me some, uh, uh, another stuff. A lot of these books, for instance, Judy Carter's and uh, is concentrated, concentrated on one joke. How do you come from a joke to a story? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I, a lot of times it, it's built in, in, in two different ways. So sometimes it's the story that builds the joke or a bit, And sometimes it's the bit that builds uh, the story, uh, like I like kind of like I just said. But um, like here's an example. Like I had a I have a joke that I love telling. Uh, it's about again about my son. All my stuff's about my kids, and my family, most of my stuff, not all of it, but most of it. And uh, we had to do, I'm sure, like in your country as well, you had to do the virtual learning where all the students had to had to go from home. And so I knew that was a that was a there was funny in that, right? And I knew that 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 was relatable to a lot of people uh to in the world everybody in the world and so anybody who has kids in the world or if they didn't have kids they would get you know the, the kids have to work from home and that's got to be challenging and so i just had this crazy idea this stu- it's the stupidest idea that there was a cat that would go in front of the screen and put its butt up in front of the screen so you saw the cat's butt and i was like okay that's the funny thing so how do i work around that And then I just built this whole bit around like all this, all the absurdity that that I that I had to live through with the kid for the whole year that the kid was doing this. And I just kind of, you know, listened into these the classes that he was in and, and just thought, continued to think about building towards this cat butt moment. <laughs> and then uh, and that ended up being a bit. And so, you know, in that case, you know, it's just this this circumstance uh, led to a story and then this sort of this thing I created in my head that never really happened. And I actually, you know, I say it never really happened. I'm, I, I watched the cat kind of uh, go across the kids like screen. I don't think it ever made it in front of the video, but that was enough to be like, aha, it could be a cat butt. And that's funny. Um, so, you know, who knows where they come from? There, there's inspirations ever, from a cat rubbing against a computer screen is where inspiration can come from. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I in my uh, professional career, I'm a photographer, and uh, inspiration is all around us. So we just take it. Uh, how important is it for you? For instance, you've mentioned uh, a couple of times already. Drew Jordan uh, is he a part of your like uh, bouncing ideas group, or do you have a writing group? Or a- absolutely, yeah. So uh, Drew and I, as a part of Breaking Down Bits, for about a year and a half, we ran uh, just about every Tuesday night. We would run an online mic. Uh, feedback mic and we would work with comics from all over the country and uh, that was a healthy way to grow uh, since then we've it's become a little harder because Tuesday nights like I told you since we started doing the show more frequently uh, it has been harder to, to commit to that Tuesday night so unfortunately we had to shut that down and uh, we just couldn't keep up with the consistency of it but uh, in any case uh, I have a group of comics that I I'm in a group chat with on Facebook Messenger. Uh, 
I will, Drew and I usually before shows will bounce new ideas, especially tonight, Thursday night, you know, the first show of the, of the weekend. Usually him and I will have a few ideas. We'll be bouncing off each other before the show. We'll, we'll throw them into our set. Um, and so, yeah, he, Drew's probably my, 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 my closest collaborator uh, just because we understand each other's point of view. We listen to so much of each other's comedy because we're on like all the same shows. And uh, so that one's really helpful. And then I've got a few other guys that I work with. Um, we also, here's an interesting one. We have different show formats that we run. So if, if you have an opportunity to get like a room like I have, and you can run more than one show a week or more than one show a night, it's a wise idea to create different formats for two reasons. One, because it gives people uh, different reasons to come back. And by different formats, what I mean is like tonight, our first show, it's called Live, Laugh, Love. And that's a relationship show. So it's all about sex, dating, relationships. It's kind of cool. We do stand up. And then at the end, we have a panel where all the comics answer questions from the audience. So that's sort of a, a format that we run um, as an example. Uh, so we do different ones. So we have another one that's just storytelling, uh, for example. So I tell you all that because uh, that is one way to, again, keep your audience coming back week to week because they know they're always going to get something different. But also it's an opportunity to, to write for different things. So that relationship show, obviously, I'm spending time thinking about uh, different material around my, my relationship with my wife. And then for the storytelling show, I'm always thinking about what's a different story I can workshop or what's a different bit that I have that I can stretch out into something bigger and I call that headlining practice. That's that's expanding your bits into longer stories. And so um, challenge yourself and create different formats. Those are two quick examples. I mean, we have, I think, probably eight or 10 different formats that we run each month. And Drew and I participate in a lot of those. And so that helps us stretch and grow as writers. Um, and how large is your venue where you're having uh, your shows now? How many people does it sit Yeah, um, right now we have chairs and tables. It sits 110. Okay, We're about to modify. Yeah, it's pretty good. We're about to modify the room. Uh, our occupancy fire code is about 170. And uh, once we finish modifying the room without tables, we can get to about that 170. So that's pretty exciting. But that's uh, a lot of people already. Uh, are you... Uh, confident enough into trying new new stuff or do you go to some other open mics around town to to check out if the material works before you try it on your own show yeah i mean ideally you're able to try it out uh in, in front of an open mic but i mean the the, the shitty part i just don't have the energy to do it like mon <laughs> monday through wednesday i'm just so wiped out uh and then plus i've got commitments like to my family and to my wife so i really try not to, to, to i just need the rest So I don't get to as many open mics as I'd like. The cool part is when you run like all these shows, since you're, they'll put you right up whenever you want to go. So, uh, you know, I should take advantage of that more. Uh, but I'll tell you, like, you know, because we're, uh, because we're so used to our room, because we're, we just perform so much, we're starting to learn how to just inject those little, even if it's just starting with a couple, you know, a couple sentences of a joke of a bit, trying it out and then backing out professionally and then getting on to, to the proven material without, you know, sort of ruining the, the, the production. So, and usually, usually we're, we're good enough with our jokes where we can hit on the first one, maybe not like a hard hit, but like, an, like Hey, there's something there. Um, you know, Drew, Drew takes more chances. He's been in it longer than me maybe a little more courageous than me and certainly a better writer than me. And he takes a lot more chances on stage than I do. Um, but uh, but we, we're not afraid to, to try out material. We, one of our rules though, is like we try not to do it so much in our host sets. So like Drew and I will alternate, like he'll host a show and then I'll host a show. So we try to do it more when we're doing that second or third spot in the show um, as opposed to the host show. Cause it's important that you have, you, you, you're really bringing the crowd on board. You gotta, you gotta come out strong to set the, 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 um, the tone for the rest of the show. Uh, oh, uh, very, very good, very good, very good. Uh, good advice is don't, don't, don't uh, play when you're host, for instance, but you can play when you're just a performer. And uh, um, another question uh, we talked about before, uh, you, for instance, said the people are getting drunk. Uh, of course, everybody had that experience already. Uh, here in Slovenia, uh, people are really, the, the pub, uh, they're really nice. The crowd is always usually okay you have a couple of assholes now and then but usually they're really nice really nice 
and they're so nice they want to record you and post it so you get more uh, eyes on your material which of course we do not want right <laughs> how is it uh, in in uh, houston with that yeah that's another thing that we talk about up top so we say hey look no videoing uh you know we actually encourage them to take pictures and then tag it in our social media because that's a way to, for us to get some more organic reach with our marketing uh through you know especially through instagram as one of our core platforms uh that's really that really hits our demographic we're really sort of 30 40 year old uh, you know people on dates uh groups of friends in that so that instagram is really the right spot for that but um yeah with video uh we we do say it up top whenever our comics are coming in we record everything and we record it so we can catch those special moments in the room uh, that can be put on social media, that can be used for video. We're about to get real more, in, we're about to get uh, a lot more intentional about putting more video content. Uh, it's pretty evident that uh, between Instagram Reels and TikTok, that that those are getting more organic reach than anything that's a still image. Uh, and so uh, Drew records everything. Drew's a pretty talented uh, videographer, uh, video editor, photo editor, all that stuff. And so uh, we record it and, and uh and it, unless the comics, the headliners to ask us not to, but most of the case, most of the time they're happy to, that we do that because then they can do the same thing with their material. But yeah, as far as audience, no, we, we ask them uh, not to video and we're, we're not really, you know, some clubs will say like, Hey, if you do it, you're going to have to leave immediately. We just don't have a lot of problems with it. We really don't. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, it used to be, I, I've seen a couple of documentaries and read a couple of books uh they used to have to pay to get their tape uh, from the uh, i think it was the comedy store uh but uh, for instance uh, andrew schultz schultz of course everybody knows him now uh he was quite unknown before he started doing his big uh big uh, videos but there were just short clips put he put on the internet uh are you considering doing something like that for your local comics yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's the move. Uh, the intern that we have starting in May, that's going to be one of her core responsibilities. And so Drew will have all of the, the raw footage. Um, I'll have her as much as possible in the back of the room, uh, marking down the times when certain things happen in the room that might be uh, uh, useful uh, for those types of clips. And then we would then post that uh, to the web. And of course, like, you know, the, the idea is not to really burn anybody's material. So we're really looking for the, the crowd interaction, those types of moments more so than we are looking at, you know, funny material. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I run a couple of open, open mics as well. And uh, because it's a small scene, I also usually just put up a GoPro. And uh, for instance, uh, uh, an interesting f uh, thing for Drew, you can see when the comics are uh, having big laughs because the audio form goes from ha 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 So it's a really a long stretch of laughs. So you don't have to perhaps mark the time, just look at the waveform uh, where the sound is getting louder. Very smart. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, I, I cut it up into chunks so each com comic gets his own clip, not the whole show. Uh, so they don't copy or uh, we don't have any problems with that. And uh, you can just see, oh, here was a big laugh. Here was a big applause. Probably the comic changed. <laughs> yeah, right. That makes sense. Uh, perfect. Interns, interns. So you already grew your, your stuff. Uh, stuff, you said, uh, is getting bigger. And um, do, are, do you manage to keep up with your comedy? Do you have personal ambitions to get better? And do you have, I, I know you already talked about your family life, but do you manage to, you know, because it's, it's okay, it's hard to organize stuff. You have to sometimes, okay, you host and stuff, but do you, do, do you get enough material? Uh, do you generate enough material in your, uh, what do you think? Though? Yeah, it's, uh, it is something that, that concerns me not having enough time uh, in mind share. There's only so much creative bandwidth that you can have. And like, quite honestly, like a majority of my bandwidth, uh, creative bandwidth right now is going to the business. I mean, uh, dreaming up this comedy, it's this massive comedy festival we're putting on where we don't do anything small. And, and so, you know, that, that takes up bandwidth, uh, you know, relaunching Ha Ha for Hope and putting that, that's going to take up some bandwidth. And so, yeah, there, there is not uh, enough time in the day to do everything. But, uh, but, you know, I still managed to, to put, to get new material. I mean, I just, you know, just this week I started working on a new story from going to be bringing to our storytelling show. 
Uh, it's just an incredibly funny story. So I'm going to start unpacking some of that and that'll end up being a bit for sure. And like, so I mean, I'd say like once a month, I, I, I've got something, an inkling of something that ends up being a bit. And I mean, I, you know, I just started headlining. So, I mean, I've, I, what, I, what I've mostly been doing uh, at the riot, you know, at the riot, my comedy show, we'll do about 10, 10 minute sets, 12 minute sets, sometimes 15, sometimes 20. And I'm just sort of rotating through the, the bits that I have and just keeping them hot, keeping them fresh, uh, you know, rotating basically through 45 minutes of material. And then uh, and then slowly adding and slowly taking away. Like there's a couple of bits where I'm like, this is just not fitting. It's not working with my character anymore. So, you know, I'm kind of at this 45 minute and I'm comfortable with that. And now it's more about adding more quality and taking away things that aren't as quality. And so, yeah, I, I think I'm growing at a, at a healthy enough clip. You know, I'm still pretty new. So for me to crank out like a minute a month is 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 definitely a minute or two a month is is great, honestly. Yeah, the the uh, uh, this is Ralph May said. Yeah, I minutes mean, come hard. I minutes mean, come hard. Uh, for instance, I enjoy listening to to uh, breakingdownbits.com. Uh, uh, of course, uh, I, I I listen usually just put it up on YouTube when I'm editing photos and some other podcasts. So I have this like comedy talking behind us. So whoop, when I editing and after, when I start writing, you already get in some mood for writing. Uh, do you have any shows you listen to or any podcasts that you would re recommend? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, some of my favorite podcasts, um, I like Tuesdays with Stories, which is Mark Norman and Joe Liss. Uh, I like uh, They Might Be Drunk, which is uh, uh, Mark Norman and uh, and uh, Sam Morrell. Sam Morrell, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I haven't listened to it in a while, but Bill Burr, every now and again, uh, Monday, Monday morning, Uh, every now and again, I listen to Joe Rogan, especially if it's a comedian, uh, Burt Kreischer, uh, anything that he's on, man, that guy's just a fun hang. Uh, and it's just so cool to listen to those guys interact. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's so many, uh, podcasts. I, uh, sorry, do you mean, uh, the two bears, one cave or another one? Yeah. Yeah. I just listened to two bears, one cave. Yeah. I was just listening to that this morning. Uh, I'm not, I honestly don't listen to that too much, but I was listening to it today. So yeah, th does it get you in the mood for writing as well? You know, no. I mean, the big thing that gets me in the mood for writing is is breaking down bits. You know, being right immersed in 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 with right with the comics. I mean, those are all so inspiring. And I'll go back and listen to those too. That that is the thing that more than anything gets me in the mood for writing. Uh, there used to be a show called um, Let's Talk About Sets. I don't know if you've heard of that. Oh But yes. <laughs> Yeah, so they stopped doing their their stuff. That's kind of why we started the thing. They they stopped doing them, and so we're like, hey, why don't we just do it? You know, the 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 comics are are sitting at home. They're not doing anything. They they sure they would find, they would talk to us all day if we asked them to. So um, that's part of the reason this thing was born was uh uh you know the the fact that those guys stopped doing it. There's another one. Um, uh, what's the vulture one? Uh, Good one? A good one? Uh, yes, good ones. Good yeah. ones. Good ones. Yeah, there's a lot of those are really good. Not all of them. Oh, and then another one, uh, Mike uh, 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 Berbigula's Ber podcast. Story time. Yeah, those ones are all great. Those are those are all more writing focused, right? So those are all uh, really helpful if you want to get into the, like kind of what we do on Breaking Down Bits, get behind the curtain, get into the weeds of, of writing and performing. Uh, comedy build-ups and breakdowns perhaps as well? I don't know that one, uh, but I I, I, I I can't go on without mentioning uh, Hot Breath, Joel Byers. Oh, of course, you know, of course. A friend of mine, so that would be rude, rude of me not to do that. Let's talk about sets. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what I was saying. That's where, that's where our friend. Yeah. But they're not making new ones, right? Have you, they haven't started. I haven't no, 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 no. They, they haven't. They haven't. Uh, I just opened up my phone and I got a uh, role to play. Yay. I, uh, I've been in an audition this Uh, Tuesday, oh, and I've got, yay, I'm going to be a Finnish guy in a commercial. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I've already been, been a northerner in a couple of commercials. So, uh, but, uh, thank you very much for, for your time. Uh, no, let's not talk about my... Uh, once again, ah, I got distracted. It's perfect. It's listening. Uh, listening back. Uh, one cr crucial thing, just perhaps uh, uh, for, for the end, uh, part of uh, the show... Uh, breaking down bits is callbacks when you where you and Drew talk about what you've learned from the previous episode, which I think was a genius idea. Oh, thank you. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's, uh, how did you come up with that? So that you like review material. What have you learned from pre the previous guest? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're always when you're trying to promote or put to put on these anything, you're always trying to find hooks and ways to get people to listen to to more of it. Um, so that was one way that I came up with to get people to go back and listen to other episodes. Um, but also, like callbacks is like such an important part of my comedy. If you if you know my comedy, a lot of my writing. Uh, <clears throat> I set up callbacks and, 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 uh, and I think it's an important technique uh, that I use quite a bit. So the, the, that's where the name come from. And then just the idea that, you know, let's reference the previous episode just to get them not just listening yeah. to the episodes they're on now, but let them know that, hey, there's a bunch more great stuff out there. And here's why you should listen to it. Uh, I'm gonna, not going to uh, play the sound, but you used to have the uh, lightning round as well. Uh, uh, what would you say on your thumbs, tombstone? Oh yeah, yeah, the yeah the lightning round is uh, is big. Uh, ours is uh, uh, last laugh. Yeah, last laugh. Sorry, sorry, sorry. What's uh, yeah? And the sound was so loud in the, the beginning. You you uh, the levels were better afterwards. But, oh, yeah. the lightning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll, yeah. Tell, oh. I'll tell Drew. Drew edits. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. You, you, you're already corrected it. You're already corrected it. That's why I had the lightning run. Yeah, that's the sound. The thunder, thund thunderous sound. Uh, I'm not going to keep you for too long. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian, for your time. Uh, I hope that people got some uh, uh, good advice from, from this talk. And I really, really suggest uh, you check out breakingdownbits.com. Uh, I'm going to put your videos in uh, the middle of, so people do, do please click on them and... Uh, Rewatch it. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, have a lovely day, and uh, perhaps we we might see each other one time live in the uh, future. Hey, Matei, I hope so, man. Good, good to meet you, and hope to see you live. See you later. Thank you. All. See you. Bye.